The surprising dynamics behind how we learn, implications for performance support. My name is Dr. Veronica Yan. I am a cognitive psychologist and learning scientist. This is a talk that was first presented as a lightning round at the eLearning Guild's 2016 Focus on Learning Conference in Austin, Texas. What does cognitive research say about memory and learning and how can we leverage what we know about memory to improve training and instruction? First of all, our memories do not exist on a single spectrum, with forgetting or not at all learned at one end, to completely learned at the other. Forgetting is not the opposite of learning. Rather, how memorable something is can be indexed in two ways, as storage strength and retrieval strength. Storage strength is a measure of whether information is deeply embedded or well learned. In other words, is it likely to be recalled later? Barring organic brain damage, storage strength cannot decrease. Rather, it is presumed to only accumulate. Storage strength cannot be directly measured, but it must be inferred. What is directly measurable is retrieval strength, which is how easily something can be recalled right now. The retrieval strength of an item can fluctuate up and down depending on the cues in the environment. In other words, retrieval strength may be mapped onto performance, can you do it right now? Whereas storage strength maps onto learning, information that is durable and which can be flexibly used in the future. Let's consider some examples that help clarify the distinction between the two. What is your hotel room number here at this conference? The number should come very easily to mind. It has high retrieval strength, but it is not actually well learned. It has low storage strength. You won't remember this number next year, just as you probably do not remember your hotel room number from last year. This hotel room number from last year has both low retrieval strength and low storage strength. How about your cell phone number? Likely, this number comes to mind very easily. It has high retrieval strength. Unlike the hotel room number you're staying at here, however, your phone number will continue being easy to recall because it also has high storage strength. Now how about your childhood phone number? You might be a bit rustier at this, because you haven't had to use it for quite some time, but it is actually well learned and will come back to you quickly with some prompts. This childhood phone number has relatively lower retrieval strength, but high storage strength. How does this apply to the workplace? One goal of training is that we want people to both perform something well, but also learn it well, so that the skill or knowledge can be drawn upon quickly and flexibly in future situations. Driving is an everyday example of something that has to have both high performance and high learning. Tackling problems with clients is another example of a skill that must be deeply learned. On the other hand, there are other tasks that we need to perform well, but do not necessarily need to learn deeply. For example, being able to use a fire extinguisher is not something that we need in our everyday lives, but when we do need it, it needs to be done quickly and accurately. These might be tasks that are infrequently used in the workplace or procedures that are likely to rapidly change. We can therefore make a distinction between performance support, what we need for the fire extinguisher situation, and performance learning, what we need for the driving situation. Let's focus on performance learning, because it turns out building up storage strength is actually quite tricky. And it's tricky because retrieval strength and storage strength are related in a peculiar way. When we study a piece of information, both the retrieval strength and the storage strength of that information increases. But how much storage strength our learning increases by is inversely related to the initial retrieval strength of that information. That is, when retrieval strength is low, when something is difficult to recall, that is where there is the greatest potential for boosting learning. If something is already fresh on the mind, it has high retrieval strength, then restudying it then and there leads to only small gains in storage strength. Improving storage strength or learning is therefore not just a straightforward matter of spending more time studying. Let's think about this from a different angle. When learning feels easy, this is often because retrieval strength is high. But retrieval strength may be high because you already know it, and therefore there isn't much to be gained with respect to storage strength. Or retrieval strength is high because you just saw it and it is fresh on your mind. Again, you'll only get small learning gains. In other words, when retrieval strength is high, regardless of the underlying storage strength, relatively little learning is happening. If it feels easy, you are not maximizing your learning opportunity. Even worse, ineffective training strategies may lead to illusions of learning when you think that you know it, but you actually don't. Let's consider two schedules of training. 
one in which training is crammed or massed into a concentrated day or two, that's represented by the yellow squares, and one in which the same amount of training is spread out over days or even weeks, represented by the blue squares. If you test people right at the very end of training to see how much they have learned, we often find that people can regurgitate a lot of information immediately after mass training. However, if we test people again a week later, a month later, or on the job when they actually need to use that information, what hundreds of psychology studies have shown time and time again is that in fact space training will lead to better long-term learning. In another example, let's compare restudying to retrieving information from your own memory. In this experiment illustrated here, researchers compared differing levels of study and self-testing. Five minutes after the end of training, those who studied more recalled more. The dark gray bar, uh, representing people who studied and restudied and restudied and restudied, four S's, is higher than the light gray bar, representing people who studied once and then tested themselves on what they studied repeatedly. However, one week post-training, the pattern completely reverses. Those who passively studied forgot half of what they thought they had learned, while those who had been active and repeatedly retrieved information from memory, they actually learned. You see, when learners are required to be more active, struggle, and engage more deeply with the information, they ultimately learn better. Spacing and testing are just two of a set of strategies that are referred to as desirable difficulties. They are desirable because they lead to better learning, but they are difficult because they require more effort out of the learner. They may lead to a greater number of errors being made early on during training and may make learning feel as if it is progressing slower. In fact, the cognitive psychology literature often makes a distinction between performance and learning. The things that support performance are often the things that hinder learning. For this reason, desirable difficulties are counterintuitive. These four graphs each represent a different experiment exploring different types of learning strategies. On the x-axis of each graph, as we go from left to right, we go from less effective to more effective learning strategies. You can see that the red performance line goes up. However, if we ask participants in these studies which strategy they believe leads to better learning, we find that their intuitions can often be exactly wrong. That is, people, learners, and instructors alike tend to base future learning on current performance, even when current performance is not an accurate indicator of long-term learning. How do we get from our starting point, low retrieval strength and low storage strength, to our goal of high performance or high retrieval strength and high learning or high storage strength? The literature generally shows us that the things that help learning are the ones that slow down performance. So to get to our goal, we have to go through low performance. This suggests that we need to create a space for safe failures during training. But also, we can think of ways to get to our goal while promoting performance as it is needed. Can we turn performance versus learning into performance and learning? Perhaps there are hybrid methods that target both performance and learning. So for example, instead of purely spacing training out, we might start with relatively smaller spacing intervals, providing that little extra bit of support, that then gradually increase over time as that information gets better and better learned. And then, before we actually need to perform a task, we might provide mass performance support. This was a whirlwind primer on some of the ways cognitive psychology can shed light on issues of performance support and workplace training, but it still barely scratches the surface. For more information, visit my website or please feel free to contact me.